Hallelujah. Amen. Our God is good. And all the time. Amen. We give all the glory to Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can somebody say amen? amen? There is power in the name of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 We welcome everybody to Hunger Generation tonight. It is a wonderful night. Every single Wednesday is special. Every single Wednesday we're believing for people to be saved. Every single Wednesday we're believing for people to be healed and for people to be freed in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. This is a fantastic week where uh, one of our wonderful people is going to get married this weekend. Uh, Anna and Bogdan, we're really happy for them. Amen. And on Sunday night I'm going to be uh, going to Baker City. Really excited uh, for that to minister in uh, one youth group. And so it's going to be just a fantastic time. But we are here right now and we believe God has a special plan for our lives. He has a special thing for us uh, even tonight as we're going to hear the Word of God. And so let's not, each one of you, no matter what you came with today, whatever challenges you have, I want to just remind you to have your eyes fixed on Jesus. Nothing is too difficult for God. Today I was reading another testimony of a person who about uh, less than a month ago uh, when we uh, when I went to one camp in Sacramento and she received prayer but she never testified and she wrote on a comment on our Facebook saying that Pastor Vlad I just want to let you know that a few days later when you already left uh, the pain was completely gone out of my body and I'm completely pain free all the glory goes to Jesus. And there's already a lot of other people who we don't even hear on testimonies who get healed who get saved and who get blessed because Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever can somebody say amen and so we had a fantastic night fantastic prayer line on Sunday and I think one of the most outstanding moments that happened on Sunday was when a little girl 10 years of age we start praying for her and the demon starts speaking out from her and I know from our home group and every other home group people have really just said you know we've seen deliverances and they were so inspiring but this one was something else because a girl that's 10 years old you know you just don't expect that I mean we don't doubt that kids have demons <laughs> we don't never doubt that okay <laughs> and so people who say well kids don't have demons <laughs> other we know kids have demons <laughs> we just never had kids being delivered from demons <laughs> Some of you are not laughing from that. <laughs> That's where you should be laughing. But at the same time, this was very amazing to see stubbornness. You know, it's like you would know kids always have stubbornness. And so to see that bedwetting and all of this stuff was so amazing. And, but I know at the same time, a lot of people find it very offensive. Some people find the very idea of casting out our demons out of people in the church, out of kids, very offensive. Well, we are not the ones who invented this. Um, there, I'm going to read to you one story from the Bible where um, Jesus actually also cast out evil spirit out of a child and that wasn't offensive because it helped the child and it glorified the name of God. Can somebody say amen? amen. So if you have your Bible let's go to we're going to read one verse Matthew 17 and verse 14 and the verse this is at the end of that deliverance if you want to take time read a few verses before and you will read the story about a little child who was brought to Jesus and the Bible says who had epilepsy and who had this um, had this problem that many people call it mental problem today and they just medicate and put people in the hospitals but in those days as it is today many times after sickness behind a physical sickness there is a demon and Jesus instead of just healing that person or giving them medicine Jesus rebuked the demon and the Bible says when the demon was gone the, ba the, the boy was completely restored which tells us that behind sicknesses many times there is demonic presence and until a person gets rid of that demonic presence a person will never experience health and so popping medicine and putting them on suicide watch is not going to really help them until they get freed. Amen. And so after all of this was done, Jesus said to his disciples, but this kind means this particular case was a case of epilepsy, a case of like a schizophrenia. It was a mental issue and it's a very severe issue. And Jesus says that this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And so we're going to take this message briefly and let's title it this kind this kind this kind 
many people in our generation especially younger people who get educated they come to such an education where they get a little bit crazy the more education they get the crazier they could become where they would get up at the age of 25 26 and make statements such as there is no God if you ever get educated to that level you need to get uneducated because you got over educated when you say there is no God it's an absolute statement which requires absolute knowledge for example if you say there is no gold in China that is an absolute statement which requires an absolute knowledge for example if you say there is no gold in China that means you have to have searched China every piece of real estate of China every mile deep in every tree in every grandma's teeth perhaps there's gold there you have to check every cat and dog you have to check every building and you have to check every water source to come to the conclusion there is no gold in China now because you don't have that knowledge expertise and time and that ability to do that you have no right to come to the conclusion there is no gold in China somebody who says there is no God has to fly to the galaxies upon galaxies has to know the smallest details the molecules he has to know every single thing every single place and nobody can do that no atheist no mathematician no philosopher nobody can do that which simply means anybody who says there is no God says it out of ignorance arrogance maybe they don't want to have God but they cannot say there is no God without absolute knowledge they may say I don't want to have God that's a different story but to say there is no God requires absolute knowledge now on the contrary I don't have to have absolute knowledge to say there is gold in China I only need to have one golden tooth and be in China to say there is gold in China you don't have to believe there is gold in China you don't have to see gold in China you don't have to even ever know that there is gold in China but that if there is one ounce of gold in China my statement that there is gold in China is accurate that's why people like you and I can may not have the highest degrees and the most diplomas and may not be able to argue you with people of Darwinism and people with evolution who can get up and say that God exists and your statement is true why because you've talked to him you've seen his power because you've seen his glory and because you've experienced him and therefore your statement is true and when somebody says there is no God it's arrogance I don't care how many PhDs you have behind your name can somebody say amen, amen. now that's usually the people in our world the people within the Christian world or the religious world have other problems we believe God exists that's why we're religious our problem happens is when we go around not believing that there is Satan and demons and partially it's not that they don't exist it's just we don't want them to exist and sometimes we think that by shoving our head into the sand will cause devil and his kingdom to disappear newsflash that's not how he lives it's not ignorance that drives away demons and it's not ignorance that will defeat them in the Old Testament if you read Old Testament very carefully you will see that in the Old Testament there was all kinds of miracles miracles outstanding but there was one particular occurrence that was absent in the whole Old Testament it was casting out of demons Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, David, Samuel, all of these great prophets who brought fire from heaven, Enoch and Elijah, these guys didn't even die. They just took a road trip elevator straight to heaven. I mean, these guys were supernatural lifestyle. These people split Red Seas. They caused the sun to stop and, it's, and the earth to stop orbiting. I mean, these guys did amazing miracles, but there was one thing that was missing in all of the Old Testament. Not once you see a prophet or a great man of God casting out demons 
you see even demons lightly mentioned once in a while the distressing spirit comes upon Saul a spirit of lying spirit of heaviness we see a haughty spirit a proud spirit but we don't see casting out of demons and here comes Jesus a carpenter 30 years of age he first defeats the devil personally and then starts to defeat him publicly which already tells us a lesson you can't defeat the devil within others if you don't defeat the devil within you can somebody say amen <laughs> Jesus comes after the wilderness where he defeated Satan personally doesn't that tell you that right away the next moment he gets up to preach reads book of Isaiah and the devil begins to show up right in the synagogue not in the witch where some where the witches are gathered or the satanists or people pulling out their Ouija boards there was Torah there were the orthodox Jews who believed in one God and Jesus gets up and begins to preach and the Bible says a demon begins to speak out right in the synagogue and Jesus drives out the demon out of the person and the person becomes free and everybody says what is this we've heard about the Red Sea we've heard about the fire we've heard about healings we've heard about the dead being raised but this is new why is this new because the first Adam faced the devil on a personal level and got defeated by him and ever since then people never faced the devil again and instead of fighting the devil they fought one another and the Bible clearly states when we fight against flesh and blood we cannot fight against the devil that means the only way we are able to fight against the enemy is when we cease to stop fighting against one another. And the Old Testament, what do the people do? Fought one another. Kings, judges, prophets, what do these people do? All of them did one thing. They always fought against other people. Even with the anointing, even with the power of God, they always did that. In the New Testament, Jesus never equipped his disciples. They did never training for like Navy SEALs or soldiers. You don't see disciples doing push-ups in the morning, you know, building their biceps and triceps, you know, learning the guns, learning the knife tricks so they can go fight the Roman Empire. You don't see Jesus always telling them one thing, guys, the way we're going to conquer this world is not the way they did it in the Old Testament. We will go to the source of the problem and we will defeat the devil where Adam was defeated by him. Him. and so we see Jesus getting up and casting out demons we see Jesus doing that now I am not a follower of Moses I love Moses I'm not a follower of Elijah I love Elijah I am a Christian that means I have to be Christ like people many times say the reason why Jesus healed is because the medicine in that day was not advanced and today medicine is advanced healing is not necessary I, I saw the commercial yesterday for fibromyalgia on the news on the TV and they had this commercial for the advanced medicine where if you take this medicine for the sickness of fibromyalgia after that you will have symptoms I think they spent 45 seconds describing the symptoms and five seconds describing what it's going to do for you <laughs> they described the fact that you will have a heartburn they described the fact that you will have suicidal thoughts they describe the fact that you will have a weakness. They describe the fact that you actually your sexual desire might be lower down. After they described all of that, I'm like, I think fibromyalgia doesn't sound that bad. <laughs> Please understand, I don't want to make fun of our medicine system. If without medicine, without doctors, without operations, without the advancement of science, we will not be able to be where we are today because because of that we get flu shots because of that so many things we get prevented but please understand with the advancement of our medicine we still need healing medicine treats Jesus heals Jesus did not heal because Jesus had no medicine Jesus healed is because medicine has its limits and Jesus is unlimited and therefore today Jesus Christ still loves to heal why because there are many medicines who cannot heal the person but they can only dumb the pain and sometimes even hurt the person physically and doctors will also acknowledge that can somebody say amen some people say the reason why Jesus cast out demons is because philosophy psychology and counseling wasn't fully developed and now we don't need to cast out demons we just medicate them yeah we medicate them enough until the person pulls the gun goes shoots everybody and we say what what happened demons cannot be medicated they must be cast out curses must be broken 
they cannot be counseled there is a need for counseling there is a place for psychology there is a place for sociology there is a place for philosophy there's a place for all of these things but when you're dealing with something that is of another world nothing of this world can overcome it Jesus did not cast out demons because Jesus did not know psychology Jesus did not cast out demons because Jesus was was not aware of philosophy Jesus cast out demons because he knew that the prince of this world is older than a human peanut-sized brain and the only thing that's going to crush him is the power of his name amen. and the power of his blood can somebody say amen? amen and so today when the issue of healing the issue of deliverance from demons the issue of salvation of soul is very essential you can have a nice mercedes standing outside you can have the best doctor and the best health insurance in Tri cities you can have a house on the top of the mountain and you can make six digit income i just mentioned three simple things that none of us here have but if you do you have an eternal soul and that soul is not going to die and that soul cannot be filled with the rims on your mercedes the size of your house or the size of your paycheck on. there's only one thing that fills that soul is the one who made it he's the only one big enough to satisfy it a boyfriend a girlfriend pornography drugs alcohol very soon will only make the void bigger and bigger and bigger until that void becomes so big that it becomes an invitation for demons themselves demons of depression discouragement and suicide and they come in and they begin to destroy the person and the only person who's able to satisfy that void is the one who made it his name is Jesus Christ can somebody say amen, amen. so we see this story of disciples where they are where they are casting out a demon out of a person who has a demon let me just mention one more thing a lot of Christians or a lot of religious community does not practice this what Jesus practiced when it comes to healing it seems like everybody believes in healing even though there's very little healing that is happening in a lot of Christian communities but we're very open to healing healing is good free, uh, free health for many people so they, they just they, everybody welcomes it when it comes to casting out of, sp of demons or evil, evil spirits a lot of Christians also believe in it as long as we are doing that out of witch doctors or people who are somewhere deep 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 into Satanism the problem with those two kinds of people is most likely they'll never come to our churches and therefore the idea of casting out evil spirits remains for those really 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 bad people like the witch doctors and people who are like satanic priests who are probably not going to come here but Jesus did not cast out demons from satanic priests though they existed we don't see occultic men hidden from other countries coming in who practice some witchcraft and Jesus casting out spirits out of them we see actually out of normal people who live normal life some a little bit abnormal like the guy who was running around naked and tied and lived in the caves crazy but everybody else they were normal people who struggled with normal things and Jesus would come on the scene and the Bible says he would come against the evil spirit and the demon would come out and the person's life would be changed Christians as Christians sometimes we have a problem swallowing that idea because we believe that if you accept Jesus into your heart immediately Jesus being the light comes in and all the darkness is gone now that is correct theologically that is correct positionally but that is not correct practically because to say when Jesus comes into your heart and all the darkness leaves is to say when Jesus comes into your heart all of your fear all of your doubt all of your unforgiveness all of your past and everything that is negative also vanishes now that is a good statement but it's practically not true because when you receive Jesus there's still some stuff you got to work with anxiety fear depression unforgiveness sleepless nights lust pride amen ask answer my question how can Jesus live inside of you being the light and fear live there as well 
I remember talking to one young leader, a youth pastor actually, and he said, I have a hard time believing. How do you guys pray for people to, demons to come out of people if they are Christians? I'm like, why not? He said, Jesus and demons cannot live together. I asked him, can Jesus and anxiety live together? I said, there, is, there, is anxiety mentioned as one of the fruit of the Spirit? I don't think so. Anxiety is not from God. Anxiety is dark. Jesus is light. How can Jesus and anxiety live together? I'm like, do you ever get anxious? He said, yes. How can Jesus live with anxiety? He's light and anxiety is darkness. Why doesn't he cast it out? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, I do. <laughs> That's why we have to cast out that anxiety. Because Jesus lives in you doesn't necessarily mean everything is gone. You know what it means? This is what it means. When Jesus comes to live within you, he gives you victory right away positionally and after he gives you victory he says go and fight it's kind of like in the book of Joshua remember when Joshua goes into the promised land and the Bible says that they see this big city of Jericho and God meets with Joshua and has this encounter this like it's kind of like your moment with Jesus when Jesus comes into your heart God comes with Joshua says remove your shoes he removes his shoes he says Joshua you're the man of valor I'm the captain of the Lord's armies nice to meet you my name is so and so we just met it's kind of like your salvation and then he says Joshua I've given you Jericho and all of its mighty men, they are within your hands by Joshua. And Joshua leaves, walks out. He says, that was a fantastic meeting with God. He looks at Jericho and it's still there. I don't understand. Was Jesus bluffing? Was, was God saying the truth? He said, he's given me victory, but Jericho is still standing but then this angel this God saying to Joshua now go and circle Jericho and take it down I don't understand Lord you just gave me victory and now you're telling me to go fight yes in the spiritual world I shifted things in your favor so that now you can make it into the practical and you can see that a reality see most of us think when Jesus comes into your heart and gives you victory that means everything just quickly changes everything changes in the spiritual world where now in the spiritual world God's favor is on your side not God's wrath is on your side but you can still live with walls around your life if you choose not to act on that victory and make it a reality in your practical life can somebody say amen, amen. so we don't fight for victory we fight from victory as Christians getting victory does not necessarily mean you avoid a fight getting victory means you're thrown into one most of us think oh, i just want to get a victory so i don't have to go into the rain god's way of victory is when i give you victory you're going to go into the rain it's not a diploma that causes you not to go to school it's a certificate that causes you start school victory is completely different with god than it is with the world and that's why when Jesus comes into your heart as a believer you must understand there are some cases where somebody experiences amazing freedom when alcohol can be broken depression can be broken but if we be very honest in here we will all come to the same realization and conclusion not every single thing gets solved when you give your life to Jesus Christ what gets changed is your position in the spiritual world and then if you fight if you stand on the promises of God, if you receive prayer, submit to leadership, that position will become your condition. Can somebody say amen? amen. That position will turn into your, in your condition. So we see Jesus coming to his disciples and his disciples casting out a demon out of this boy who had epilepsy. And this boy who was epileptic in our day and age he would be put on medicine in our day and age we would rebuke anybody who would try to say this is demonic we would say this is mental we would say there's science and there's a proof there's a scan that there are problems in his brain functions and this has nothing to do with the demons this all has to do with chemicals and has to do with his brain disciples are not theologians disciples are not spiritual gurus some of these guys 
just yesterday they still have fish smell in their clothes one of these guys is a thief I mean he ripped people off as a tax collector some other guys they were just fishermen the only one somebody said was very educated and rich was Judas and that didn't help him so a lot of these guys they're not super educated they are not very versed in theology they don't know much about Torah and here you have amateurs looking at the physical case and they know more about spiritual world than rabbis here you have fishermen casting out demons not pastors not apostles not bishops not evangelists these guys are not some great men of God these are just fishermen but they're going around casting out demons where did they learn that from it's sure not from their school and it's sure not from their synagogues you know who they learned it from somebody they've been hanging out with named Jesus they've seen Jesus do this and they start doing that when we reject our mentors we also reject the move of the supernatural in our lives you know one of the main reasons why we don't see demons being cast out today in churches is because we are not surrounded by those who do. There's always people God will raise up to deliver captives. Always. And the problem with those people is sometimes they're a little bit different. They're not like us. They may have a different color of skin. They may have a different accent. They might be in a different continent and they might not speak like we would want them to speak. Their services are not hour and 20 minutes but 11 hours and 20 minutes. They're a little bit different than us. And what happens with us is many times if we connect ourselves like disciples to Jesus, you will very soon find yourself doing what Jesus was doing. And that is exactly what is happening even in our ministry. The healings that you see here, the healings that you hear here, the, the very reason why when we go and travel and even this Sunday night, when we will go to another city and pray for the sick and God is going to heal people. This is not happening just an accident. This is happening because after a while, because we've been connected to ministries, that these things are happening. And because these things are happening there, it's rubbing off on us. It's always been like this. Disciples were doing this because Jesus was doing this. And if you want to walk in the supernatural, either God will give you supernaturally, or naturally you have to find somebody who does that and follow them this applies in every area of your life if you're single if you're married and you hang out with single people in a matter of time you'll be single statistics says that every person who's getting divorced has singles around them if you are wanting to be wealthy and you always around surround yourself with broke minded people very soon no matter how much money you make you'll be broke because bananas do not grow in Alaska. Bananas grow in Jamaica because of environment and because of atmosphere. There are certain aspirations and dreams and desires. No matter how gifted you are from God, if you are not in the proper environment, those things will never become a reality. And so you see disciples of Jesus surround yourself with Jesus and Jesus goes around does something that nobody has ever done before and you see disciples Jesus is gone on a mountain the three most important leaders are with Jesus and the rest are like immature leaders are left and you see them walking around casting out demons that is the power of being surrounded with the right mentor that is the power of being surrounded with the right mentor that is why in our church you will see more and more of the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in our services with these healings that we see today and this will just be a scratching the surface why because the persecution that we already have went through and endured of people laughing making fun of us and leaving the church and saying you guys are crazy you watch the TB Joshua you show those testimonies have you noticed that in the service today how many testimonies you've heard that's already from our own church and the people who left our church who said why don't we play our own testimonies well we had none <laughs> sadly some of them are not here today to hear our own testimonies to enjoy them but we paid the price we're going to continue to pay the price 
of connecting ourselves unapologetically to the places where God is moving. We're not going to go and try to please that one little person who gets offended over every single thing. We're going to try to please the Holy Spirit and we want to do what God did in the New Testament in our own churches. The people that you listen to, the people that you follow on podcast, the books that you read very soon will resemble your own life. If you want to move in the Holy Spirit, make sure you're listening to someone who is. They may be brilliant, they may have a PhD, they may make you laugh and giggle and you may feel good but that's all you're gonna get. But if you want to move in the Holy Spirit, find someone who moves in the Holy Spirit, listen to them, walk with them, follow their teaching, let them inspire you, encourage you and challenge you and it will rub off on you as well in Jesus name. Why did disciples cast out demons? Why did they even come to this person and instead of sending them to the hospital or instead of saying, hey father, your son has a little mental problem, take him to the doctor. Why did they go straight to the root of the problem? Because their mentor showed them how. And we have good mentors. We are really thankful to God for that. And it's going to rub off more and more on our ministry and on our lives. That is one of the reasons why in a month or so, you know, I'm going to Ukraine for two weeks for that reason. That's one of the reasons why right after Ukraine I'm going to go to Lagos, Nigeria for that reason. And it's amazing because both of those countries right now are in a very critical condition. <laughs> Ukraine is one of those places you shouldn't travel to and sadly even Nigeria. But for us it's different. For us it's different. There's always going to be some kind of a scandal going on somewhere. America is not safe either. Nobody's safe as long as you're on this earth. But we're going to follow good mentors and we're going to have great results. Can somebody say amen? And so we see disciples of Jesus, they are casting out a demon out of this little boy and the scripture says that they cannot cast out the demon. They're not successful. And so they're not able to help him because they're not able to heal him. They're not able to heal him because they're not able to cast out an evil spirit. And here they come to the conclusion, the demon is not leaving. Maybe it's not demon after all. Maybe it's just a physical problem. Maybe God allowed this for his mysterious will for there is good. If this would have happened today, first of all this boy wouldn't be prayed for casting out of demons. But if he would have been prayed for and there was no prayer, there was no answer for prayer, usually you would come to the parents and how a lot of people would do is say this must be the will of God. He must be teaching you something. He has some hidden agenda. Something somehow he will use this to glorify his name and strengthen your faith and test your faith and to honor his name go home. Disciples maybe would have done the same thing except Jesus ruined it. Jesus comes on the scene and the whole idea that we prayed and nothing happened so it must be the will of God goes out of the window. The thought I want to share with you is unanswered prayers are not indication of God's will. We prayed for her and she didn't get healed. It must be God. Or it must be the fact we don't have faith. It's amazing how we always, when we fail at something or when we have a bad disappointment or experience with something, we always drag God's will to it. We somehow think that God's will fluctuates. It means how, how I'm doing, that's how God is doing. If I prayed for somebody and they got healed, God must be right now healing people. But if I prayed and you didn't get healed, that means God is not healing nobody. Since when did God's will connect it to the strength of your faith? And Jesus comes and ruins the whole thing because they pray and nothing happened. And instead of coming to the doctrine that God might not be in the business of healing and delivering and saving and changing people's lives, Jesus comes on the scene and he cures the boy and once for all settles the issue. Is it God's will to heal? It's not determined by how many people you and I prayed. It's determined by how many people Jesus prayed and what Jesus said. That is the will of God, not your experience or my experience. Come on. Come on. Jesus is the will of God, not my unanswered prayer. And just because I tried something and it didn't work, that does not mean God's will is now brought to the level of my bad experience. Jesus once for all settles it. That God's will is to save, God's will is to heal and God's will is to deliver. Let's never mix our weakness with God's will. Let's never bring God's will to the level of our weakness. How many times you meet with men or with young women who struggle with the tendencies toward homosexuality 
and they all convinced that it is God's will for them to be like that and if you will ask them deeply why they will tell you I've tried and cannot overcome therefore it must be God's will for me what if a guy who's sitting in the penitentiary say I'm a molester I tried and couldn't overcome it must be the way God made me would you use that same measurement for him of course not what if somebody who kills people for pleasure we use the same standard and says I tried to kill stop killing but it doesn't work it must be God's will for me that is a dangerous path when you drag God's will to the level of your experience we always must lift our experience to the level of God's will we almost might say we are weak but God is strong and I might not be able to help you right now but listen let me go to someone who can and let me go get more faith more prayer more fasting but listen this is not God's will just because I am weak and somebody say amen. amen never drag God's will to the level of your weakness lift your weakness to the level of God's will and Bible says let the weak say it doesn't say let the weak say that God is weak it says let the weak say that I am strong it means lift your weakness to the level of God's strength can somebody say amen? amen so Jesus comes and he sees the disciples are trying this and they're not able to do it and the father comes to Jesus and says Jesus your boys don't got power your boys don't have any power weak sauce and Jesus looks at the father and he says that's not because they don't have power he said they they have power they actually have all the power they they just lack the necessary faith to release that power. Jesus never once indicated that disciples lacked power. Jesus didn't look at the disciples and says, guys, you lost your power. Go find it. He says, you guys have all the power that you need. You just lack the faith, necessary faith to release the power you already have. This kind, meaning they used to pray for the sick, and people got healed but this case was a little bit more severe it required a little bit more faith than before faith I didn't have I remember a few months ago one of my units in a duplex there was a, um, a problem with the water coming down from the shower and if you're a landlord that's one of the phone calls you always dread when people call you and they say that the water is not you know going through the toilet or through the shower and I remember uh, I called my father and my father he went there and I just went along to help him with anything he would need and so and he started he brought all the tools that you would usually use like a small snake he put it through the shower trying to you know see if there's any hair if there's any anybody through anything uh, through also um, through the toilet he would push it in and it would still not go through and so until we went in the basement and found the clean out and decided to take the snake you know up into the second floor from the basement to see maybe there's something in there but when we got to the basement we found out that the cleaner the clean out place it was not open probably for the past 40 years it was so rusty that the tools we had were not capable to open that clean out we had an option do we just leave it like that and simply say well this is beyond repair I just burn the duplex <laughs> do we just simply let those people say you know what guys don't take showers 21st century that's not gonna happen or we went to the store and we said initially we came for this problem with a certain set of tools but we need to have a little better tools we got the big tool came with it yes it took a few minutes and after that that little rusty thing that was been there for so long completely got opened and we cleaned out the sewer and everything was fixed it's amazing how that common sense works so easily with everything except church because when you face a problem and there is no answer you quickly think God's will period when that happens with your car you don't put a sign and say God's will you go for a better mechanic when something else happens in the house you don't put a God sign God's will bring the matches let's light it, light it on fire and call insurance to give us money back you don't do that no you look for another person who can who have a little bit better skills a little bit better when it comes to spiritual things we pray once we pray twice and after that we're like well it must be the will of God since God is in control and God makes the decisions for us but Jesus makes it very clear to us that sometimes we do not have proper tools to deal with the source of our problems and those proper tools is just a little bit more of faith when I was 16 I had to read this book 
for those of you who are listening and are not seeing this is a book called department of licensing washington driver guide this was my bible at the age of 16. i read it maybe five or six times i thought i knew how to drive because i already had experience and i read this book to just solidify my knowledge we were about three months three years into united states so english was a little bit tough for me i remember going to the columbia clearwater office over there to take the test i went took the first test in english and i failed i remember being disappointed i was convinced all the questions on the test were not in the book <laughs> i'm like i read the book i know what the book says and whatever questions they have they probably have gotten from another book that I, they never gave me but you know what they told me surprisingly is that they're not allowed to put things on the test they are not in this book but they are allowed to put things on a test that are not in my mind God is not obligated to give you challenges the challenges that you will face in your life are proportional to this book but not to you in this book just like I went to take a test and I had a certain amount of this book in my head and I failed you know I wish I would say I took a second a second test and succeeded but I didn't I took a second test in Russian and I failed again it doesn't matter which book I read Russian or English I just needed to get more of this book inside of me for me to to fa face and to overcome the test and I remember reading it third time and now I memorized it I read it I tested it I did everything and I got so much of this book inside of me that it was coming out of me I knew every single thing in this book and now when I went again to take exactly same test I found out that actually everything I needed to have to answer the test was in this book the problem is this book was not inside of me that's exactly what happens with life every challenge you're facing this book has answers to help you conquer it every demon that comes your way this book can crush it God people say always God will never let anything happen to you that you cannot handle that's like saying a teacher will never give you a test that you don't know answers for it's a joke teacher will never give you a test of things that are not in the book but it is your task how much of the things in the book go into your head not the teachers and therefore sometimes we face challenges that are bigger than us and we say where is God in this the same God who allows these challenges gives us victory over these challenges in this book Amen. in his name in the community of believers and when we allow these things to penetrate us on a deeper level we will overcome them if we allow them to come into superficial level and just and we just do it just enough to get by you will hit a test and realize oh my goodness this is bigger than me and this is not a point to throw away the bible when i failed the first time my point was not to set this on fire my point was to come back home and realize i just got a little bit more studying to do not less when you got hit and you cannot overcome sin, something it doesn't mean you need to pray less actually Jesus says you need to pray a little bit more because this kind means this challenge you are facing has a little bit bigger than your faith and so you gotta get your faith worked up to the level of the challenge so the challenge can be overcome nothing in your life will ever be allowed in your life without you having what it takes to overcome Amen. nothing every curse that has come maybe against your way every demonic activity everything in the family the mess and the chaos nothing will ever be permitted to come that you already don't have a victory for but this victory has to leave from the pages of this book into the lips of the believer this victory has to leave from here into here and from here into here and from here into here 
It has to come inside of us and it has to take control of us and it has to possess us like the same way this book started to possess a 16 year old teenager and today I'm proud to say I have a drive license. The reason why is because I overcame that challenge. You can overcome your past. You can overcome the fact that you made plenty of mistakes. You can overcome the fact that you're still being pulled on every single side every single day. You can overcome the things people have done to you and people have said to you. You can overcome the fact that your parents are absent or they may be abusive. You can overcome the fact that you are a mom at a young age and you never planned to be a mom at this age but here you are and maybe you're without a job. You can overcome the fact that you don't have education today but at this time most of your friends already have. You can overcome the fact that the past in your life is nothing to write home about but you're at that age but it's getting too late. You can overcome everything and anything. And this is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus overcame through this. You can overcome through this. I'm not just talking about getting a scripture a day on your phone screen to ease your guilty conscience. If I would read this book the way some people read the Bible, I would be 90 and I will never pass the test. You cannot overcome without letting this word have you. It's not enough to read it. You have to allow it to read you. It's not enough to come to church. You have to sink yourself so deep in the teachings and in the Holy Spirit's presence that it overtakes you. The dominion of the Word of God is the rulership of Jesus. Meaning as men, as much of you as the Word of God dominates, that's how much of you Jesus rules. No more and no less. You can overcome. Maybe you're facing a pornography issue. Maybe you're addicted to some kind of a drinking or smoking. And you're wrestling on your own and you cannot overcome. And it seems like bigger and st or stronger than you. Maybe you're trapped in the homosexual tendencies. I want to tell you something that whatever challenge you're facing, you have an answer. The answer is not even within God. The answer is already within the Holy Spirit. The answer is within the Word of God and it's within your reach. You can go back into the room and study this a little bit more. Or you can keep living the same life the way you've been living before and you will have exactly the same results as you've been having before. This kind means God has challenges for us that we are gonna have to overcome. God has a vision for us that we are going to achieve. God has a revival in store for us that we are going to have to attain. But this kind cannot come without also us rising a level of our faith, commitment and loyalty to the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen? I just want to encourage every single person here. Please be encouraged. Don't drag yourself to the level of your defeat. Shake off the defeat. Go take it again. Get a little bit stronger in the Lord. Go do it again. Face it again and you will overcome in Jesus' name. This will not be a place of victims. This is a place for champions, for the glory of God. Amen. You're not going to be a victim. I'm not going to be a victim. You and I are going to be champions. We may have scars, but we're not going to have wounds. We may have scars, but we're not going to have pain. Why? Because Jesus Christ will turn that pain into gain and our scars into stars for the glory of God. Let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ. Let's rise to our feet.